Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's with my fourth man in the fire, time after time. And born of his spirit, and washed in his blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. So I trust in God and my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God and my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. In perfect submission, and all is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow is all of my steps. So this is my story. And this is my song. I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. And I trust in Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail, no, I trust in God and my Savior.
Today is the day to behold the one who can move the mountains and part the seas, and yet he is gentle enough to tend to our broken hearts and breathe life back into us. This is Hope Today. We're so glad that you're with us on this Friday. I'm Anna, and I'm here with Sydney and Matt. And you know, not only is God mighty enough to move mountains, but he is mighty enough to bring life out of the devastation of a wildfire. We know that many of you have seen the smoke all over the area, and we're thinking about those who are most affected by the wildfires and knowing that God's presence goes before all devastation, and he is ready to bring life out of that. And so we're just excited that God is here. And even as this goes out over the airwaves today, that it is penetrating through all fog, all smoke, all devastation. And yeah. so Matt, we're just uh, excited about the topic today and yeah. upholding God. Yeah, it's gonna be so good. Listen, have you ever wondered if God hears your prayers? You know, I think that's a question most of us have wrestled with one time or another. So come up in just a moment, you're going to hear from an evangelist named Ray Comfort, and he's going to share one major key that may be holding you back from your prayer life and experiencing all that God, or all of God's abundant blessings. It's a conversation that you're definitely not going to want to miss. It's going to be really good. Yeah, talking about the fear of the Lord, and it's like, I feel like right now, Ken Blair, I know he's their director, to play that video again of the, the smoke and like the wildfires are what we're seeing. I mean, just blanketing. I mean, it's so incredible of like what is happening and what's going on. And, you know, all this week at the Presence Conference at Covenant Church of Pittsburgh, there was actually a prophetic word that came about about the wildfires and the smoke and about what God is doing. And so um, his name is Ron Campbell. He's a prophet that's from Scotland, was like going into this word about this is very significant of what's happening. And even God is just reminding me, you remember last year we saw those, those clouds, the Mamatu's clouds that mm -hmm. happened and then it was the overturn of Roe versus Wade. And then again, we're seeing in June, this is happening as a prophetic sign of the wildfires of like what God is doing in the season. And they were just talking about, you know, we saw what the Asbury were revival earlier this year, what was going on, that it actually was a seed planted in the ground of revival and that we are really on the precipice. We are really on the cusp of a move of God. And we just want to encourage you today. I know there's so many people we hear about. We're talking about revival. We're contending for revival. We're praying for revival. Revival starts first within. It starts first with us seeking the face of God. It starts with repentance. It starts about looking at the idolatry in our lives and really getting before the face of the Lord and asking God to be the wildfire in us. Like God is is a consuming yes. fire. Let us, him consume us. And as we allow him to consume us, as we allow him to get deep down into our bone, into our mirror, and to pull out and uproot those things, we will begin to see transformation in our culture and our cities like never before. But we just want to encourage you today with that. We truly believe that God is on the move and something William McDowell was ministering last night and something that he said that really stuck out to me is that he was saying that when you see a blade, you know, when you see like a plant, like sprout, like a little sprout seedling, when you see a blade, get excited because that's the sign of the harvest. Sometimes where I feel like we're all like revival, we're going to see mass this and mass that. But he said, when you start seeing the blade, Asbury was a blade. We're seeing different things. Even you go on TikTok or social media, we're seeing moves of God like never before. So let's get ready and get excited. But it is so important for us to first have a reverence for the Lord. Tom had a chance to sit down with Ray Comfort earlier. Take a look at this. Most people believe that God hears their prayers regardless of their spiritual walk. Our next guest though says that scripture warns us that living in sin can influence God's attention. Ray Comfort joins us now and in his book, How to Make Sure God Hears Your Prayers, he shares how answered prayers and obedience to God all begin with fearing the Lord. Welcome back to Hope Today, Ray. Thank you, Tom. Good to be with you. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we've heard that all our life. God hears all of our prayers. Uh, is this really true, regardless, you know, regardless of where we're at with Him? It's really no big deal about God hearing your prayers unless you're hanging over a thousand foot cliff by your teeth, or you're upside down in severe turbulence at 20,000 feet. Then you need to make sure God hears your prayers. If you want to talk to the King of England, you can't show up in your pajamas. There's certain etiquette that takes place. Exactly the same applies with God. Bible says of Jesus, he was heard in that he feared. Jesus had a, a, a wholesome fear of God, a healthy fear of God. Um, most people think God hears their prayers, but the scripture says differently. This is what it says. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, your sins have made a separation 
between you and your God, so he will not hear. It's not that God doesn't hear. It's just that he doesn't regard or take notice of your prayers if you have sin in your heart. So it's very, very important to cultivate the fear of God in your heart because if you don't fear God, you won't depart from sin. The Bible says, through the fear of the Lord, bend apart from evil. I don't think there's any doctrine that's as disdained as the fear of the Lord in contemporary uh, America or even sometimes within the church. But the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, fear not him who has power to kill your body, but fear him who has power to kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Fear him. Ask most people what their image of God is, and it's not one of a fearsome figure in the sense that they see him as the old man in the sky, sitting in a cloud, wearing a pink nightie, playing touch fingers with Adam. God is nothing like that. And so as Christians, we don't, we're not terrified of God. We don't have that fear that has torment, but we have a healthy fear of God, a deep awe and a reverence for God to a point we will certainly obey him. You know, Ray, I, I think about uh, my own father, uh, how there was fear and there was love in the same place, you know, and, and, and uh, it's kind of like the, 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 the old song, you know, Amazing Grace, that grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. There's both sides of that for sure. But let me ask you about what, a char what are the characteristics of a God-fearing person? Well, you'll keep your heart free from sin. Uh, let me share with you um, something that that really has helped me understand the whole thing, what Jesus was saying about fearing God and fearing him who can cast your soul into hell. I'm originally from New Zealand. You could probably tell by a slight accent that I've got. But when I lived in New Zealand 35 years ago, the police didn't have guns. If a criminal was naughty, they would hit him with a stick. And same with England, that they now have guns because things have changed. So when I came to the United States and began open air preaching, I had one advantage over most Christians. When a police officer walked up to me, I'd say to myself, he has a gun. That's all I'd see, this gun on the side in a holster. And I'd think to myself, this man can kill me legally if I move too quickly. If he thinks his life is in danger, he wants to get home tonight, he can shoot me and it's all over, my life is over, and he can do it legally. So I had more than a healthy fear of the police. It's a fear of what he can do to me. And that's the sort of fear the unsaved people should have. Fear not him who has power to kill your body and afterwards do no more, but fear him who has power to kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Let me share something that's very personal. When I was 16, six years before I became a Christian, I found myself at the back of a dance hall at night in long grass with a gorgeous 16-year-old female. And believe me, my intentions were not honorable. But as we lay there, she said six words that put the fear of God in me. She just said this, you know what? God's watching us. And I thought, <laughs> and it was like a bucket of ice fell on me and just steam arose. And I said, hey, let's go back into the dance hall. The fear of the Lord caused me to depart from evil. I could have got her pregnant. I could have shamed her parents, shamed my parents, could have instigated an abortion. I don't know. But I look back and I say, thank God for a healthy fear of God that caused me to depart from sin. And that's the sort of fear I cultivate in my life. It's the fear of the Lord that stops me looking at the pleasure of pornography or listening to gossip. The fear of the Lord will keep you on the straight and narrow because you, you, you not only know what God can do to sinners, but you know what he did through the cross. That cross should make us tremble. That God went to such extreme because he so loves justice and truth and righteousness that he had inhabited a human being. Jesus was the express image of the invisible God, and then his wrath would come upon him so that we could be saved and have everlasting life. That should make us fear. Absolutely. You know, that, that love that had him take the weight of all of our sin on there. Yes, we should fear God. Let me ask you about a, a, a chapter in this book. You, it's called Guilty Not Condemned. That really stood out to me, that title of one of the chapters. Could you explain what you mean by that title? Yeah, I find it very, very um, profitable to share with an unsaved person who has no sobriety about sin what death actually is, according to the Bible. I said, do you know what death is, according to the Bible? They say, no a little bit arrogant. So, well, it's wages. 
The Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, God is paying you in death for your sin. It's like a judge looks at a heinous criminal who's laughing because he has killed three or four women. The judge says, this is deadly serious. He says, no, it's not judge. They were just prostitutes, the scum of the earth. I was doing society a favor. The judge says, I'm going to show you how serious this is. We're paying you in the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. This is what you've earned. And then I look at the sinner and say, sin is so serious to a holy God, he's given you the death sentence. You're on death row, capital punishment. Your death will be evidence that God is deadly serious about sin. But when you're a Christian, God paid the wages through Christ. The law was satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. That's why he cried out, it is finished. Just before he died, he was saying, the debt has been paid. We broke God's law. Jesus paid the fine. And just as in court, if you've got speeding fines, a judge can let you go if somebody else pays them. He'll say, oh, you're guilty, but you can go because someone paid your fine. And we are guilty before God, but not condemned because Jesus paid our fine. That's called grace, God's unmerited favor, his mercy. And that's what John Newton spoke of. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yeah, that word wretch, have you ever, I've noticed some people don't like the word wretch, but you know what? We're wretches. We're wretches without the, the, the glorious gospel. Let me ask you about a, another character we see in, in scripture, Judas. You, you comment about Judas and about how he had a seared conscience. How is Judas a warning to us as believers? We can learn a lot from Judas. We can learn about the power of money. You know, Judas was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He was there when Jesus walked on water. He was there when he calmed the storm, fed the, the uh, multitudes with loaves and fishes. And yet it was be meaningless to him because of his love for money. You hold a one penny up to your eye, you cannot see anything. It'll just cover everything. And that's what the love of money does. And so you and I have got to be very careful, careful. You remember those three warnings for the preacher? God, girls, and glory. Gold, girls, and glory, sorry. Gold, girls, and glory. We should be so careful when it comes to the love of money. Jesus said you cannot serve God and man. We'll either love one and hate the other. You know, when it comes to money, we can find our security or our God in money. We look to our money for the future. We look to our money for our peace. We look to money for our comfort. They're all things that we should give to God. God should be our comfort. He should be in charge of our future. We should find our peace because we love him. So it's very important to have a loose hand when it comes to finances so you never get caught up with the love of money as did Judas. You know, Judas was never a Christian. Jesus said, one of you is a devil. You don't say that about God's children. And our churches are filled with goats among the sheep, foolish virgins among the wise bad fish among the good. And Jesus said they're going to be sorted out on judgment day. And the thing that will sort us out before the day of judgment is a good, healthy fear, good, healthy fear of God. To understand that God sees lust as adultery, hatred as murder, lying lips are an abomination to him, and all liars are at their part in the lake of fire. So how can we cultivate the fear of God? We could move to Texas and see a thunderstorm in Texas. That'll put the fear of God in you. Or you can read scripture and how God killed Ananias and Sapphira because they told one lie. Or how he killed Uzzah because he steadied the ark when God is holy. Or how he killed a man in Genesis 38 because he didn't like what he did sexually. Those biblical incidences should help us have a balanced fear of God. So we love God because of the cross. He's proved his love. But we fear God because of his holiness. And the fear of the Lord will cause us to depart from evil. Wow, I mean, that's a strong word, but it's in the, it's the scriptures. It's what's in scripture, it's what is true. So let's say this, you mentioned some promises for those who fear God. Could you just share one or two of those with us? One of the uh, greatest reproaches on human nature I can see in scripture is Mark 16, verse 15. This is gonna sound strange at first. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature shows the shamefulness of our own selfish hearts. By that I mean this, if a doctor finds a cure to cancer and all around him are cancer patients, you should not have to go up to him and say, go to all these patients and give them the cure. No, he shouldn't have to be told. He should run to it because he loves people, he has compassion for them, and he's deeply concerned about their pains and the fact they're gonna die. 
And you and I shouldn't have to be told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We should run to it because we love the lost. And that's what the disciples did. They said, we cannot but speak that which we've seen and heard. That's right, absolutely. Well, the book is called How to Make Sure God Hears Your Prayers. That's a great title and a great subject and it's something we need to hear about and that's the fear of the Lord. Ray Comfort, thank you so much for being with us again on Hope Today. You're very welcome. Well, we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back with more. One of Cornerstone Television's greatest offerings is our 24-7 prayer line. I'm Crystal Tillman, CTVN's Director of Marketing and Development. Irene wrote to us and shared, I called Friday for prayer. It was a wonderful prayer and touched my heart. We are thankful for dedicated, spirit-filled prayer partners and for those of you who support this vital ministry. Every year, we receive tens of thousands of calls. That's a lot of lives touched. Hope happens here. Well, hope surely does happen here. We're so glad that you're with us here on Hope Today talking about the fear of the Lord. We love to bring you scripture, the truth of God's word. Today's verse comes from Proverbs 9, 10, and it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And you guys, I liked how Ray talked about um, knowing how holy God is, that he does hold life and he holds death. And it is us who are responsible to get into Christ, to have Christ as our savior, to be covered by the blood of Jesus so that we have become the righteousness of Christ. Yeah, that's really good. You know, uh, on my desk at work, I have this little sign. It says, I saw that and under it says God. <laughs> you know? and, and so I like how Ray was talking about that yeah. a little bit. You know, one thing that kind of, and it's a healthy fear, right? right. It helps, it, obviously we know we live in a fallen world. We're only flesh and bone and we're gonna sin and mess up and fall short. Thank God for his grace. Mm -hmm. One thing is when you understand and have a fear for God, it kind of helps to motivate you to say, okay, I can see the temptation, but I know God is watching, you know what I mean? And I want the favor and blessing of God on my life. I don't want something that's going to kind of distract me, you know, pull me away from it, Sid. And, and I know you probably feel the same way, but I love that, you know, God's watching at all times, but it's a healthy fear to have, you know? I was like, what was your sign on your desk? That says, it says, I saw that. God. <laughs> I, I love that because I think when you think about that, I mean, there's like certain times in my life where it's like, oh, you get convicted. You're just like, oh my goodness, I can't walk in this way. And you know, one, I love this scripture from Proverbs 9, 10, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's something that I just love that so much. A fear means like the reverence, the awe yes. of God. I don't know about you, but there one thing I remember that I experienced having the fear of the Lord is when I had an encounter with him. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in his presence and I just could not get up. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but when he is God and he comes down and I was like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. like your glory, your kavat is on me right now and I can't get up because you are God alone. And that is something that we desire for all of you to have is have an encounter and experience with God because one day we know it's happening. Jesus is not saying like, oh, this might happen. No, Jesus, every knee, every tribe, every tongue will bow down to Jesus. What a fear we're all gonna have. But God right now wants all of us right now to experience the fear of the Lord because he has so much love for us. Well, we're going to finish up and wrap up the show with Matt. He performed a song for us called Gratitude. Take it in and be blessed. Have a great day. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express? sing these songs as I often do every song must end you ever so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again so
except for hearts singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You got a lion. up your soul. Except for our hearts and 